The Darce Choke is a submission executed from the front headlock position. It involves encircling the opponent's neck with the crook of one's arm, while the other arm wraps around the opponent's arm and applies pressure against the neck, leading to a tap or unconsciousness. The Darce, on the other hand. Ladies and gentlemen, we are live for UFC 300 exclusive episode of The Darce. I'm Danny Brasco. I'm here with my guys, Mr. Plus Money and Slick Montana, breaking down every single fight on this card and giving you guys the best betting angles and ways to make money on this epic 300 card. So guys, before we get into action, because every single fight could be a main event on a fight card, I just got to get overall thoughts. Maybe fight you're looking forward to most. I'll start with you, Mr. Plus. What is a fight that you just cannot miss on this card? Oh my goodness. Gaethje Holloway could be the people's fight, the BMF title. I'm pumped, man. Every single fight on this card could be a fight night main event, if you ask me. Absolutely, man. It's maybe the quite possibly the best UFC event they've ever put together. Slick, what's the fight that you're circling on your fight card? Yeah, man, we're going to have to go straight to the main event. You know, this main event has got a little pushback for being the main event for UFC 300. Now it's starting to get into the rhythm with everybody. A lot of people are starting to like this main event. So now it's just about to see what we're going to see from Hill coming off that Keeley surgery. And then now is, is Alex Pereira really going to be dominant enough? And he's still saying that if he wins this fight with no injuries, he wants to headline UFC Rio de Janeiro, UFC 301. So we're going to see. That would be an insane turnaround. It's like you brought up the point, people talking, giving a little flack to this main event. Like, that's not a 300 main event. Are you psychotic? This is an awesome fight. Anyone that's talking down on any of these fights needs to call their therapist immediately because something's wrong with you inside and no one can do anything for you. With that being said, let's start off the fight card, fellas, and let's break down every single one. Thanks for watching, guys. Hit the like, hit the subscribe. The Darce is live on YouTube, baby, and we're excited to grow this channel and be with you guys. So let's start off by making some money. First fight on up the card, we have Cody No Love Garbrandt taking on Davison, Deus de Guerra, the god of war, Figueiredo. And this is a fun fight, guys. Bantamweight contest, we know. Figgy Figueiredo coming up from Flyweight, where he was the former champion. He looked good in his first bantamweight fight. He had a nice performance against Rob Font, really good boxer, got the W. So he'll be moving on up the uh, the ranks in bantamweight if he can get past Cody Garbrandt, who we know has been champ in championship fights before. He's had those grueling series with TJ Dillashaw, but took a lot of time off and has only fought twice in the last three years. He's looking a little sharp. We're wondering, Slick, does Cody have that chin still, right? Can he take a punch where it was looking like maybe his chin was fading? Well, he's actually the younger man in this fighter. I'm really interested to hear stylistically what you think about the boxer, the smooth footwork player, and Cody Garbrandt, or just Davison Figueredo, the god of war, maybe the more dangerous and violent striker. Slick, minus 325 tag on Figueredo, plus 250 on Cody No Love. Who are you looking at in this first fight on the card? Yeah, man, I would just say I'm real high on Davison in this spot, man. I think that he's going to have the power edge in this fight. And the one thing that I really dislike about Cody No Love is that in his last two fights, there was really predicaments that he pretty could have lost that fight. Like, he was wrestling, laying and praying against Trevin Jones. But in that third round, Trevin Jones landed a big shot, ended up wobbling him, and he was able to survive that fight. The last fight against Brian Keller, he was getting his leg chewed up. Even, even he said after the fight that if the fight would have lasted a little bit longer, he probably wouldn't have been able to continue. He was able to get that KO off Brian Keller. But I'm just not I'm just not too high for him to get the KO in this spot. I think Davidson Figueredo is a, probably a better counter puncher than and then Low Love. I think he has No Love has the combinations, but I think that's just gonna lead him to be more confident in his hands. That's gonna leave his chin wide open. And I'm not too high on, on his wrestling either. I think he has decent wrestling, but I think Davidson Figueredo does have that great guillotine that at any predicament he could probably just I would say sprawl is uh I would say sprawl with the, the takedown and maybe get no love to get off that takedown and worry about the guillotine. So I'm real high on Davidson in this fight. And the one thing that we know about him that the worry was his power translating to the to, to uh featherweight division. And it's been looking great, man. We've seen him drop five uh Rob Font twice in his last fight. So if he's able to uh drop Rob Font in his last fight, I think he's able to drop no love if he's able to get a clean shot. So give me Davidson Figueredo. I'm going I'm, I'm to give No Love a little bit of respect. And I'm going to take Davidson Figueredo by decision. I think he wins a good 29-28, landing the bigger moments, landing the bigger punches. And I and you get that plus 250 on FanDuel. 
There you go. So a good way to attack a minus 325 favorite. Slick giving you a good stylistic breakdown on why he likes Figueredo to come out on top. But by decision, right, a lot of people definitely going to bet the KO, right, think of the big power advantage, like you said. Interesting way to play it there. Plus 250 prop for a minus 325 favorite. You always like that. Mr. Plus, what is the way that you like attacking this first fight on the card? Excellent breakdown, Slick. He really said it all. There's not much more left to say, except for the fact that I did see Davison, and he looks big, man. He looks big for this weight class. I think he's going to stand right up with Cody. I don't think he's scared. I think he's got power in his hands. And I think if Cody does this thing where he wants to wrestle, I think that's going to be the problem. I can see him getting caught in a guillotine. Davison's got that great jujitsu, And it, the only thing that I will say is it's hard to pull up tape on Davison because he's beat Rob Fun up, and that was great. If you can beat Rob Fun, you can probably beat Cody Garbrandt. However, last four fights, you fought the same guy. Kind of hard to go back further than that. Um, it's 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 good to see him come up and wait because he doesn't look so sucked in anymore. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see him here. First fight of the night's going to be a banger, folks. I like Figgy and Slick. I like everything you said, except I think he gets it done inside the distance. Oh, baby. So both guys on Figgy here, like uh, Mr. Plus mentioned, the quadrilogy with Brandon Moreno has dominated <laughs> half of his career. Finally, we could see him in some new matchups, which you like. Great point about flyweight, right? He looked like he, you know, the weight, we know the weight cut was tough for him at flyweight. Could contribute to cardio issues, power issues too, chin issues even maybe. But call me crazy, Slick. I kind of like taking a shot at Cody, no love. Mr. Plus, I might go with the plus three and a half. I know the plus money is enticing at plus 250 on the money line shot. Maybe I'll sprinkle half a unit. But Slick mentioned he could see it being a 29-28 fight. Don't get it twisted. Cody no love while he may get cracked, while he may be at that power disadvantage. His footwork is clean, man. He might be the sharper, pure technical boxer. This is an MMA fight, so all strikes are at play, right? But I kind of like his hands in this spot. And I'm wondering if the time off maybe served him well. We saw him get into a, kind of a nasty fight with Brian Kelleher, right, where he ended up doing more of the damage. But Slick mentioned, I mean, Cody was taking damage too. His chin held up to some shots. We'll see if he get, the legs can stand up to the low kicks. But I see this one going to decision as well. I'm going to take Cody Garbrandt plus the three and a half at my, plus 135. I'm going to sprinkle a little on the first dog of the night and see if he can uh, shock the world here. But it won't be a popular pick. I'm looking for a good fight. And uh, I'm excited to see how this first one starts. So the fellas like in Davison in a couple different ways. I'm taking a shot on Cody and we'll see how it plays out. I'm really excited for this first one. Next fight on up the card. I think we're all going to be on the same page on this one, fellas. It's Jim freaking Miller taking on Bobby Green. King Bobby, they made Miller the dog, guys. The guy has the most wins in UFC history. He's turned from a skilled submission artist known for his grappling prowess into a rugged boxer all of a sudden. Miller will stand and trade in the pocket. The left hook, right hand combination is nasty. It can turn your lights out. And he's taking on a boxer, right? The slick head moving, shoulder rolling, hands low, Bobby Green. Slick, I feel like as of late, that defense isn't looking as slick as it used to. And in his last fight, he sustained bad damage against Jalen Turner, who knocked him out, and then the ref let the fight go on way too long. Guys, that was four months ago. That feels like a quick turnaround to come right back and fight a guy like Jim Miller, who will throw down, we know this, on UFC 300. So. I'll kick it to you first, Slick. Are you rolling with me and Jim Miller as my dog of the week? Yeah, man. I'm real high on Jim Miller in this spot, man. Watching tape on Bobby Green, I just find a recipe for disaster against Jim Miller. Uh, one thing I really dislike about Bobby Green, man, <clears throat> is that even in the interviews leading up to this fight, he's just been worried some of, of how he will get back. You know, he's basically saying, oh, yeah, you you know, you, how does somebody come back from a knockout like that? Basically, I would say basically putting a little bit of blame on the ref for letting it go a little bit too longer. And I'll, I, and I'll be a little worrisome on, on somebody that's like Jim Miller that has all the momentum in the world right now coming off a two fight win streak uh, uh, in both those fights looking spectacular, you know, Jesse Butler knocking them out in like 50 seconds, dominating three rounds against Gabriel Benitez, then subbing him in the third round. I'm just real high on Jim Miller in this spot. And honestly, I could see this same predicament just like how Drew Dober knocked out Bobby Green. You know, Bobby Drew Dober was actually able to implement at least two, three hooks at a time, and he was able to catch Bobby Green with the second and third hook. I think Jim Miller could do the same. We actually seen him do the same thing against guys like Nicholas Mota, 
We've seen him like knock out guys like Jesse Butler that he basically dipped one punch and then implemented two hooks and knocked out Jesse Butler. I can see the same thing doing Bobby Green with his lean back shoulder roll. And just the one thing I dislike about Bobby too, and that when he does lean back and try to do the shoulder roll, he doesn't really throw punches as much. And then I think that if he doesn't throw punches as much, it's not going to deter Jim Miller from just pushing in. And even if he wants to get the takedown or just implement his hooks and get and get the knockout. But if anything, we know Bobby Green takedown defense is not good. We, we're going to give the edge of 1,000% to Jim Miller if this fight's down, the fight goes down to the ground. So give me Jim Miller money line at plus. I think I got him at like plus 150 on FanDuel. But I'm honestly, you know, before we got on here, there's a little world that I'm, I might be betting Jim Miller inside the distance. I haven't really got to it yet, but Jim Miller inside the distance is a pretty good number. I think if he wins this fight, he's already saying, like like I told the guys before we got on here, the the bonuses are now 300000 for the fighters. So you know Jim Miller already said that he's looking to get that bonus. So give me Jim Miller money line, and I might be sprinkling him inside the distance. I love it, Slick. Plus 225 I saw by uh, KOTK or Sub. We don't, you know, you know Miller can get you on the ground. He can get you on the feet. I love the point you made, too. Like, Miller isn't one of these guys who's going to throw a one-shot, two-shot. That right hook, left hand, he strings four of them together, man. One, he's coming. And if you're shoulder rolling and leaning behind that shoulder and gets porous a little bit, there's a lot of strikes coming your way with nothing coming back from Green. So I like it. Man, Mr. Plus, the only question I have in my mind is, why did they make Miller a plus money dog? Explain it and tell me what you like. I can't explain that. Um, I can't explain why he's plus money because the guy was in UFC 100. He was in UFC 200. Now he's in UFC 300. This guy has been around forever and he's only getting better. It's crazy. Uh, and Bobby Green, like Slick said, is coming back too soon. When you get beat up like that and the ref doesn't call it off and you're almost unconscious and then unconscious and still getting beat, come on, man. Four months, I think it's too soon, man. I think this is a bad spot for Bobby Green. However, I see that he wants to be on this card. It's a legendary card. Why wouldn't you want to be here? You got to take your shot with Jim Miller. His best shot, if he has one, is to keep it standing and duck those punches and duck that craziness and land that one shot that we know Bobby Green has. He's got it. But as of recent, he really hasn't been as strong or as powerful of a finisher as he once was. So Bobby Green, unfortunately, after that knockout, isn't going to be the same guy. Man, I just think this division is going to keep moving without him. I see that 14 drop and way out, and there's guys that are going to move right in. Um, this is too strong and too good to not take Jim fucking Miller. We're allowed to cuss now. We're on YouTube, Danny. Jim fucking Miller for the bag, baby. Plus, Buffer. that's a great dog. That's the dog. Buffer, you got to say it, Buff. We all want Bruce Buffer to Come say on, it. Come on, Buffer. Jim, Jim fucking Miller. And, uh, <laughs> man, I love it, man. I, I, I'm listening to what he's Bobby Green saying in interviews, like you guys just mentioned. He sounds bad, man. He sounds, he sounds like a guy who's still not fully over a, a bad concussion. Like, it's, it is worrisome. So, we all like it. Jim Miller and Jim Miller probably inside the distance are going to be plays. I love that we're all on the same page here. I think the public will be on Jim Miller too. And hopefully everyone can start out with a big underdog cash and we move right on up the card where there's a lot harder fights to potentially call. Now looking past Bobby Green though, still a very slick boxer, but people looking at old man Miller, Bobby Green's 37 himself. So he's no spring chicken. We all like Miller and we laid out the case for you. Next fight on up the card, we have... Jessica Andrade taking on Marina Rodriguez. Interesting kind of clash of styles a little bit in this fight. We know that Rodriguez likes to keep it standing. She uses her rangy boxing. She's got those straight punches, that snapping jab. But her glaring weakness, takedown defense, and getting back to her feet. Andrade, powerful strikers, those power punches in her hands. But her best asset, I think, is her grappling. Right, She can get the fight to the ground. Uh, she can be really dangerous with, her, dangerous with her submission attacks. We've seen uh, her put people in mounted crucifix before. So she's got a nasty ground game. I got to imagine she's looking to take it there. So right now, Mr. Plus, Andrade minus 135, Rodriguez plus 105 dog. How do you see this fight playing out? Who executes their game plan? I like Andrade uh, with this ticket, minus 135. I think that's a great line for her. I think she can use that power. I think she's going to be the more powerful uh, woman in the in the ring here, in, in the cage. Um, and, and I do like that. I like, I like her taking her down and manipulating the ground game and taking this fight where it needs to be. She has pretty good fight IQ. Uh, I will say that she's gotten beat those few times in a row. Uh, I'm, I'm just looking at her stats here. Um, however... 
Uh, I think the only only path to victory for Rodriguez is to keep this on the feed, and I just don't see where that's going. Uh, Mackenzie Dern was, I think, better than Rodriguez, and and she beat her uh, left hook straight right. Wow. Uh, I don't think that's that, what's going to happen this time around. I think she's got to take her to the ground. I think the Muay Thai from Rodriguez is real, um, but but I don't think Andrade is going anywhere. I think she's moving up. I think this is her time to win, and I kind of like her as a parlay piece, Danny. Uh, maybe I'm crazy. Very interesting. I got to agree with you. I do like the minus 135 price tag, but I'm probably not going to put a big bet on it because we know we've seen Andrade lose to strikers. She got cracked and dropped cold by Yan Xiaonan with that straight right hand. Andrade can go headhunting sometimes. In that fight, she quadrupled the left hook with no defense. And on the fourth one, a huge swing and miss. Xiaonan smacked her with a good counter right. So I can see Rodriguez landing straight punches too. I really am going to want Andrade to grapple if she's going to win this fight. And I feel good about my bet. Slick, how do you see stylistically these uh, fighters playing out against each other? Yeah, I mean, I just think that, that you know, you got one girl that has the power edge, but I think the one girl, uh, Marino Rodriguez, is the more technical striker. And I think I'm going I'm to go with Marino Rodriguez in this spot, man. I'm real high on her, especially in this spot, coming off that crazy beatdown that she had against Michelle Waterson. And I, I get what you guys are saying about Andrade with the wrestling, but I just can't trust her to really come out here and implement that type of wrestling. You know, she shot one takedown in her last seven fights. And then the one submission that she had got in her last 12 fights was a standing arm triangle against Amanda Lamos. So I'm not real high on her in the grappling edge that to really for her to really come out here and implement that. I think she's going to stand and bang with Marina Rodriguez. And it's going to be a fight that, honestly, Andrade is probably the more acceptable to get knocked out in this spot. You know, she's been knocked out already five times in her career, and she's been finished nine out of 12 fights. So I'm not too high on her durability in this spot. And then another thing is that she's coming down in weight to 115 again. This girl has been flip-flopping weight classes all her all her career. And honestly, I just don't know what to think of it now that she's coming up, coming down to 115. Am I going to trust her chin? Absolutely not. You know, uh, Marina Rodriguez has real good Muay Thai knees. That if she gets them to the body, we've seen that what she did in her last fight, or even her all her fights, other than the fights that she that she was able to get taken down and held on. I don't think that she's gonna be able, uh, she's gonna get held on with her height and reach advantage against Jessica Andrade, and I just think she's gonna beat Andrade to the button. I like her one twos down the pipe, and I think if this will be a dog fight on the feet, I think honestly I'm gonna have to lean with Marina Rodriguez durability way more than Jessica Andrade durability at 115. So I like Marina Rodriguez at the money line. Plus 114. I got 1.5 units on that. Hey, man. All fair points made from Slick there. I like it, Mr. Plus. You brought up the Muay Thai game, too. So if Andrade is looking to grapple and they end up in clinch situations, maybe Rodriguez won't be in, in as much trouble as we perceive. Maybe the Muay Thai is on display there. Slick, I love the Amanda Lemos standing arm triangle you brought up. Of course, Andrade does have great submission skills, but one like that is a once-in-a-lifetime type of thing, right? You're not going to see too many standing arm trials and uh, triangles against the cage. So we shall see who prevails here. Me and Mr. Plus leaning towards Andrade. Slick likes Rodriguez. I'm loving all the points and angles that everyone's got. And if you're watching, follow the information that you like, right? Doesn't always all. We're not always going to all agree, but we've all got our own individual research and uh, angles that we bring to the table. Follow the money. Hopefully, uh, Yo, whatever Slick. you follow. Slick, what's she going to do about the traps, right? Andrade's traps, bro. Well, what, what, what she, what's she going to do with those, okay? Marina trap? Marina getting trapped? Uh, Andrade's traps are bigger than mine. I just want to know what uh, Marina's going to do about those. she probably just hold her head instead of her neck. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I love it. All right, guys. Next fight out up the card. This is going to be a debated one, I feel like. We have Jalen Turner taking on Renato Moicano wants money. And I think a lot of people are going to like Moicano in this spot. He's become a very popular fighter, swagger to his game, very confident and fun personality, especially <laughs> talking a lot of smack online. And he's a great grappler, right? We know he's a lethal jiu-jitsu player. His kickboxing has only gotten better throughout his career. His losses are to some, you know, some great fighters like uh, former champions and title contenders. But when he does lose, he's been getting finished, right? He's definitely has the ability to get, uh, or liability, I should say, to get cracked and get finished. So Jalen Turner, scary striker, massive lightweight for the division. Pretty much any opponent at, at 155 he's going to fight. Turner will be stronger, he'll be taller, and he'll be the rangier fighter, right? So it's a tough ask for any lightweight to match up against him. 
Uh, Mr. Plus, this one's fairly simple to me. It's either can Moicano grapple him and get him to the ground and stay safe, or is Turner going to kickbox with him and probably put damage on him? How do you see it playing out? Well, uh, Renato Moicano wants money. Uh, I'm going to take a drink for him because, uh, unfortunately, um, he's going to get knocked the fuck out on Saturday night. This is one of my easier bets, guys. I'm not going to lie. Um, Jalen Turner is going to win. This is going to be easy. He's on his way up. Moicano is now going to be on his way out. I know he had that one little spurt of the fan favorite and this and that. Nah, bro. Nope. Not going to happen. Yes, he's a powerful wrestler, but he's not going to be able to take someone down like Jalen Turner. This guy is massive for 155. It, it's crazy how big this guy is. 6'3", and he's chiseled, and he's in great shape. They call him Tarantula because it's like he has eight legs. This guy is all over the place. He's going to be all over him, on the feet, keeping distance, piecing him up. And, yo, if I think if they take it down, I think Moicano's in more trouble because Jalen Turner is stronger than him. He's going to be able to get back up, or if he takes his back, he's in trouble. I see a background and pound where he flips over. Oh, it fights over. Call it off. Jalen Turner by knockout. Either KO or TKO. It's happening. Hey, Cheers man. For you, Moicano betters. <laughs> Mr. Plus sending a salute to Moicano betters. He's got Turner. I see the angles, man. Uh, Turner, as powerful and dangerous as he is on the feet, he's got grappling skills to boot, man. He's got submission game, absolutely. So if he ends up on the back, if he ends up in a good position, he could find a submission, a club and sub, perhaps is live. So totally see your angle there. Right now, the odds straight up. Turner minus 250, Moicano plus 190. Slick, are you attacking this on the money line for either fighter and a parlay piece or the underdog, or are you looking at props? Tell me how you're playing this fight. Yeah, man, I'm actually high on Jalen Turner in this spot, man. I really like Turner. And honestly, I see Mr. Plus, was he saying, the one thing I dislike about Moicano, like four, four of his KO losses, I think three of them have come in the first round. And that's where, that's where Jalen Turner is the most dangerous. We've seen what he was able to do to Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker, probably the only man on earth that would have ate that head kick that Turner hit him with. So I, I see the same same predicament like in that Brad, Brad Riddell fight. You know, Brad Riddell got hurt on the feet and he shot a sloppy takedown. And Jalen Turner was able to take advantage of it. And when you're cut and dry, that guillotine that Jalen Turner has is just so strong, man. He just leans on you so hard. So I'm I'm high on him as a parlay piece. And I'm actually going to take a quarter unit. So for anybody that doesn't know a quarter unit, a quarter unit is basically $100 a unit is my bankroll. So a quarter unit is $25. I'm putting $25 on him to win by submission at plus 750. I think he'll probably hurt Moicano. And the one thing that we know about Moicano is that when he does get hurt, we've seen it in that Drew Dober fight. Uh, 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 Drew Dober doesn't have any type of front chokes or any type of submission threat. If he tries to shoot on, on Jalen Turner while he's hurt, I think Jalen Turner just snatches up something and get him out of there. So give me Jalen Turner money line as a parlay piece, and I'm going to take a little quarter unit sprinkle on him by submission. I really like the submission play. I feel like this fight, we'll see after the first round, right? If it gets out of the first, I feel like it's going to be a close fight. But I like the points you guys are making. I wanted to bet on Money Moicano as a dog, but I just couldn't quite take it there because I agree with you guys. I am fearing Turner's power a little bit and his submission skills if Moicano was damaged already. So I really like that plus 750 submission play slick. I think I'm going to play it two ways. Slick break, broke down the quarter unit, right, guys? If you don't want to put your normal size bet, say, for example, nice whole number like Slick gave us, a $100 bet, you can play something for half a unit, right? Half your normal size bet, a quarter of it if you're taking a bigger long shot. Go all the way down to point one if you want to bet on the round and the method, the exact thing, right? The exact time they get knocked out, right? Slick on one of his books could bet the exact type of submission. So if you want to take some fun long shots, <laughs> sprinkle the board, man. You know, lower your betting sizes and attack some big plus money. For me, I might go quarter unit Turner sub and quarter unit Moicano decision at plus 550 if the fight maybe plays out like the Drew Dober fight, right, where he gets damaged, but he's able to survive through it, keep the grappling, maybe stay safe on the ground and find his way to a judge's scorecards. Uh, maybe Moicano can edge out a decision win. So I think he's either getting finished, could be a knockout like Mr. Plus likes, could be a club and sub, maybe like Slick likes, or maybe it could be a Moicano decision. So, hey, plus 550, plus 750. All sorts of ways that you can play it. And the fellas like Turner as a potential parlay piece if you're looking to put some fighters together and make your ticket a plus money banger. All right, guys, I like the angles. Next fight on up the card, we have Diego Lopez taking on Sadiq Youssef. Guys, I'm going to make this one nice and simple. One fighter has a mullet. The other fighter doesn't. 
Diego Mo Lopez with the mullet. I don't know who's people with mullets. I think just have hidden pain or like hidden powers that they don't feel pain. They have this just something super Saiyan about them that the mullet creates in a UFC fighter. And you're going to put that on a guy like Diego Lopez, the wild man Lopez. I think he forces the fight out of Yusuf. Yusuf, I feel like to win this matchup would need to be technical and kind of safe and smart wrestle, use your boxing, stay at range. Like Lopez is a hard nosed fighter with lethal jujitsu. He'll make you fight him right now. I just feel like in that raucous Las Vegas UFC 300 environment that Lopez is going to carry that momentum probably to a victory, having the bigger moments and maybe even finishing him. We saw Yusuf really struggling against uh, old man Edson Barboza, who I'm putting no disrespect on. Barboza still got it, baby. But I think Yusuf was pretty much built to win that fight. Right? A lot of people felt like Yusuf was going to move past him and keep climbing up featherweight. But that was a little roadblock there. And all of a sudden, I got a lot of questions about Sadiq Yusuf. Now he's the dog. So, Mr. Plus, I'm not going plus money on this. I like Diego Lopez at minus 135. I'll make that a straight bet for me. What are you thinking on this fight, sir? I mean, the only respectable win by Sadiq Yusuf is the Alex Caceres in the last three years. As a matter of fact, that one to Andre Feely was four fucking years ago. Can you believe that? Four years ago by now. Feels like that was just yesterday. Um, I'll be honest, though. The Pat Sabatini win uh, for Diego Lopez is what turned me completely onto this kid, man. Uh, he is not playing around. Uh, I call him Emo Dave. Uh, Emo Dave over here, Diego. Emo D. Diego. Uh, uh, he's got a weird style about him. He's got the tats. He's got the weird hair. He does have the mullet, uh, but he's also chiseled. He's in great shape. And for this weight class, uh, what is it, 145? He's in, He's huge, man. He's a big dude uh, for 145, if you ask me. 5'11", almost 6 feet tall, and, and in great shape, bro. Uh, this kid's a problem. Uh, he's a problem for a reason. He actually prefers to grapple with you. If you want to grapple with him, he'll grapple with you. He'll take you down. He'll be a jiu-jitsu guy. He likes being on his back. He doesn't mind. He'll throw up submissions. Um, Diego Lopez is that dude. Um, however, he's also a wild man on the feet. And I believe Sadiq Yusif is going to try and uh, beat him on the feet. And that's going to be a problem. Um, Diego Lopez can eat shots. He's got a Terminator chin. And this kid is just wild, man. Uh, he's Again, uh, he's like Gaethje, becoming a calculated wild man. Um, I, I like this kid. I like what he's doing. He's one of the new guys. He's moving up quick, and I think it's for good reason, man. That's uh, another another when I see a stock rising and a stock going. Man, I, I, I just see that. After that Edwin Barboza loss, man, now you're going to lose to this kid too because this, this kid's going to be a problem. Uh, I got to go Diego Lopez. Uh, I, I got to ride with, with my gut on it. Uh, minus 140 is a great tag. I'd take him straight up. Um but, damn, this is going to be a wild one. I, I don't know. I'm not sure on the how it's going to be done yet. I, I'm still undecided. By, by by Saturday, I'll have that. But right now, I just know I'm going Diego money line. All right, so we'll ponder the method. But I agree. I'm going to play Diego Lopez money line. I like the point you made about how dangerous he is off his back, too. I mean, if Yusuf gets the takedowns and he's doing well with his offensive wrestling, it's not like he's in any, any safer position, right, Lopez? Nasty triangle chokes and arm bars. And when we see him throw, he never stops working from his back. Slick, you love guys like that. I know Slick's always looking for the guys who don't accept bad positions, who don't just lay in guard. They're using the guard to be dangerous. And his jujitsu is lethal, man. So, Slick, do you also like Diego Lopez in this spot wherever the fight goes? I'm honestly thinking that I'll pro if, if Diego Lopez does not lose this fight, I'll probably never bet against them in a three round fight ever again, man. This guy is just so dangerous every single minute of every single round. You just don't know what's going to come with this guy. Like, the worrisome of him was the chin. You know, this this guy was getting a little cracked. But honestly, man, I, I just don't think Sadiq Yusuf is going to be able to crack that chin. You know, like, this, I think this is a guy that you have to lay him out flat. Like, basically, like Nate Landwehr. You know, like, if you're not naked, knock, knocking out Nate Landwehr out cold with a flying knee like Herbert Burns did, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not knocking him out. And I just think that Sadiq Youssef, his last knockout was over five years ago against, I believe it was against the Benitez, if I'm not mistaken, after watching tape study. You know, if I'm not mistaken, it was Benitez. And we know Benitez, this guy is as chinny as it come. Jim Miller was hurting him. He knocked out by David Onama. So I'm real high on Diego Lopez in this spot, man. I just think, like Mr. Plus said, he's going to bring the fight out of Sadiq Youssef. And the Sadiq Youssef, we've seen him get into some wild exchanges. 
with I would say a more calculated and technical fighter in Barbosa. You know, like Barbosa basically burned the fight out off him after hurting him in the third round. And if I, I see Diego Lopez doing the same thing, you know, I think he comes in here, hurts Sadiq Youssef, and basically puts him in that brawl. And I would say basically make him make a mistake, you know, basically getting him to get the wrestling going, shooting a sloppy takedown, getting the fight down to the ground where we know Diego Lopez is not going to stay down. He's not going to just try to implement little elbows from full guard. He's going to try to get them subs. And if not, he's more than happy to keep this fight on the feet. So give me Diego Lopez money line at minus 140. I love it, guys. I think that sounds off the alarm for the first leg of the Dars Parlay. If the, if the fellas agree with me, uh, as you guys know, any viewers of this show who have been with us on the social medias, we all select a fighter. We agree on three fighters together, and we put our Dars Parlay every week together. Uh, I got to think Diego Lopez should be the first leg of that. Do we agree? Let's get it. Yeah, it's I'm about unanimous, to start. baby. <laughs> Mr. Plus is over here. The Ken Craft chant. Right. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> yeah. He's over here locking it in already. Let's yeah, go. I am. I, I'm actually, that's exactly what I'm looking at right now. Okay, cool. Next fight on up the card, then we have Kayla Harrison taking on Holly, the preacher's daughter, home. Couple veterans of the sport. Now, Harrison aggressively poached away from the PFL. One of the few fighters that Dana went and got from Bellator PFL, right, and really aggressively sought out. Got to feel like he really wanted a new bantamweight contender, right? It's been a weird division, kind of stale, the heavier weight classes for women, women's featherweight, which I don't even know if that's a thing anymore, and women's bantamweight, right? Looking to mix it up a little bit. And Kayla Harrison entering the fray does exactly that, right? She's been dominant in PFL, although she did fairly recently sustain a loss to Larissa Pacheco. So she showed that she is human. Well, she comes into this. Minus 425, home around plus 300. And we know Holly Holm, the electrifying kickboxer who put Ronda Rousey to sleep, changed the whole era of women's MMA with that head kick. And she's got great kickboxing, but she's getting up there in age, man. And she's become a lot more of a kind of a pure boxer now and a clinching, grinding grappler who looks to drive that head into you against the mat and, you know, keep head position, keep control against the cage and lock her hands and stay safe. So I wonder if she ends up clinching a lot in this fight slick, uh, doesn't feel like the best game plan against a judo artist like Kayla Harrison who can hip toss you, put you on the ground and keep you there. I'll say this, though. I'm not running to bet Kayla Harrison minus 425. Holm is, ex ex is as experienced as they come. So feels like a little bit of a wide line. I haven't made a bet yet. I'm very curious to hear what the fellas are thinking. Slick, I'll kick it off to you first. Who do you have? Holm as a big underdog or Kayla Harrison in her debut in the UFC? Yeah, man. I actually took a dog shot. I mean, I said a dog shot. I actually took a shot on Kayla Harrison by decision at plus 130. I love I that. I just think that we've seen people like her time and time again. There's, of course, she's going to be able to implement her elbows, but I just don't think she's going to be able to get a girl out of there like Holly Holm with, I would say, ground and pound. Because ground, she, the one thing I've seen Holly Holm does that when she is off her back, she does like react to every shot. So I could see her maybe getting hit by one elbow and her trying her hardest to sprawl and just getting this fight back to the feet. And honestly, I, I, I think Holly Holm does have a better clinch game. But I think the physicality and the, the strong of uh, of Kayla Harrison during, I mean, at fight nights, you know, this is a girl that's cutting down to 135. She's probably going to be my, like uh, 150, 155 during fight night and probably even more, you know. So I think she's going to have the physicality uh, edge in this fight. And if this fight gets down to the ground, I'm just not really too high. I think if Kayla Harrison wants to finish this fight, she would probably have to implement some type of submission, maybe arm triangle or something. But I, I honestly think that her being her this this being her first fight in the UFC, I just don't think that she's gonna try to play any games. If she's able to keep the fight down to the ground, like for the last two, three minutes, I think she's definitely gonna be able to do that more than often. So I'm actually real, real high on Kayla Harrison in the spot. Make it that she makes weight, you know. Well, I've seen the picture of her. She looks in great, great shape, you know. For her cutting down to 135, she's looking great, you know. She's, her muscles are still there. She's not looking too dehydrated. So now I'm, we're going to see if she this fight even ends up being good because at the end of the day, you got to respect that. I mean, uh, expect that this fight probably gets canceled because Holly Holm already said that if she misses weight, she's not fighting her. 
even though she doesn't give her a purse edge, I mean, a per, uh, fi a finer purse or whatever. So Holly Holm already said it, so there's not nothing new if the fight gets canceled. So hopefully Kayla Harrison makes weight and this fight gets apart. But I do have half a unit on her to win, uh, Kayla Harrison to win by decision at plus 130. I like the way Slick's playing. It's a really interesting point he made too. He talked about the rehydration for Harrison, right? Yeah, fights at bantamweight, but you put a, a you know get a day in between that, you get your food back, you get your water back, and these fighters come way up. You got to think that Harrison is going to have a big physicality and strength advantage, Mister Plus. Do you think that she can get her out of here? I'm looking at the only time Holly Holm was submitted. It's back in 2016. She got rear naked choked by Misha Cupcake Tate, and back in her you know vintage days. But other than that, only other time that Holly Holm has been finished is to the women's GOAT, Amanda Nunes, put her away. And other than that, uh, she's been able to uh, survive against other, you know, in her losses to other fighters. So how do you see this one playing out? Do you think Harrison works her and gets her out of there? Do you think Holm is live in this fight as a dog? What do you think? Uh, this is going to be a quick take here, but I do like the fight, and I'm excited to watch it. However, I'm not putting a lot of chips on it. I'm going to just sprinkle one thing and one thing only. And, and and I do think it's Kayla Harrison. And I think it's Kayla Harrison by submission. Holly Holmes, it, Holly Holm is getting old. Holly Holm isn't going to be the same. Holly Holm is going to do her thing on the feed and try and do this and that. I think Kay Kayla Harrison is going to come with that big hip toss, get on top, and I think she's going to find her way into an arm triangle. That's what I think happens. I think it's the first or second round, probably the first, while well, they're pretty dry, maybe in the third or fourth minute, and she finds that hip toss, she finds that judo toss, they find themselves on the ground, and, and Kayla locks up that arm triangle, and Holly taps the fuck out, um, out of fear, out of desperation, out of I'm old, and she can't be put in a choke for that long anymore. Uh, I just don't believe in her anymore. I think she should retire i think the gloves might be going down tomorrow um that's just a theory of mine um i think kayla harrison easily wins this one potential retirement fight for home if she gets finished early says mr plus and uh it's possible man the the judo toss maybe she gets like a head and arm choke or something like that or gets a scarf hold position maybe somehow it could be some nasty work there we'll see how it plays out uh i like it man i like either submission or decision i think those are probably the two most likely paths for Kayla Harrison. Maybe Holly surprises us, makes it closer, keeps it standing, avoids the takedowns. I was almost tempted to play like Holly plus three and a half. Guys, we're going to talk about spread betting later in the show. If you guys aren't familiar, that relates to the judges' combined scorecards. Fairly new betting method to MMA. So if you want to bet on a fighter, a little more, uh, maybe an underdog, and have some a little more safety to it, you can bet that they lose in a close fight, right? A unanimous decision, 29-28 for Kayla Harrison would actually win you plus three and a half on the spread for home. So consider that when maybe betting a close matchup that you think could go down to a close and, decision. And Brasco, just to add quick value to what you're saying there, even if you're on the decision like Slick is, as a slight hedge, if you do get, you know, if you're really in on this fight, you could actually double down and go home plus three and a half and still cash on the decision. Um, if to split, split that way and still hedge your bet as well, too. It's just a way to attack the fight. Just a thought. I love it, man. Thanks for jumping in there because uh, I always love the the kind of crafty betting angles that you're finding there. And exactly, two plus money angles uh, for both sides of the fight. If it goes the distance and it's a close one, you could be making a good deal of money there uh, on both sides. So maybe the middle of the books on if you can hit it on the head. I love it, man. All right. Next fight on up the card. We have, this is an interesting one. I can't wait to hear your takes on this. It's Aljamain Sterling at featherweight taking on Calvin Cater, and the line is a moving. This one opened around minus 120, pretty much close to pick them odds, I believe. And Aljo's all the way up to minus 180 now. Cater plus 140 dog. I'll say it from like this, fellas. At minus 120 around pick them, I kind of liked Aljo in the featherweight debut. I was thinking, okay, maybe he can get off his grappling and, you know, and uh, have to cut less weight. Maybe get some chin back right after taking a knockout to Sean O'Malley. But at minus 180, I'm not interested in betting it anymore. In fact, sometimes you bet the fighter, sometimes you bet the line. And at this line, I'd sooner bet on Calvin Cater. Uh, I like the boxing, the New England cartel, the toughness, right? Pure clash of styles, Mr. Plus. I mean, we know Aljo can strike, but he's going to want to grapple, right? As he says, if I take your back back, it's a rap rap. But... 
Hater's not so easy to just get to the backup, right? He's got really good takedown defense stats. We'll see how he looks. And Aljo no longer necessarily the weight bully, right? He was typically always bigger, larger frame, more physical uh, than his opposing bantamweights. Maybe not the case anymore at featherweight against a tough, hard-nosed guy like Calvin Cater. So Mr. Plus, plus 140 for Cater, minus 180, maybe parlay piece or a method bet for Aljo. How are you going to slice it up? Aljo stepping up, man. He's coming up in weight. This is his first time. I don't know, though, man. Both of these guys' losses are totally legit. You're talking about, I mean, excluding the getting KO'd by Arnold Allen, the Josh Emmett loss, the Max Holloway loss, and then obviously you're looking at Al Jermaine Sterling with the Sean O'Malley loss. One thing I will say is that I don't know if uh, Al Jermaine is going to be able to bully uh, Calvin Cater or anybody in this division like he used to bully in the, in the lower division. And you called him that, Brasco, the weight bully. Uh, can he do it here? Is he really going to just take the back? Is it a wrap? I don't know, man. Calvin Cater's got some angles. When I when I talked to you before, I told you the Jersey versus the Massachusetts. Man, I'll say one thing. I'm from Jersey, and Boston, Massachusetts got way better fighters than New Jersey, man. They usually whoop our ass. Um, I think if he can take those angles, keep his distance, and not get his back taken, Calvin Cater can piece him up. Uh, I kind of like him. Uh, damn, I don't know, how, by decision, 30 to, no, nah, not 30, 29, 28, maybe he gets his back taken for one round, I don't know, man, this is such a tough fight to call, I'm super excited to watch it, um, I might put a small bet on the dog, Calvin Cater. I, I like it, I yeah, man, if he's keeping it standing, you gotta think advantage Cater. Slick, do you think Aljo can get his hands on Cater? get the grappling going, put him in danger, maybe even submit him? Or is it a New England cartel show putting on that good, hard-nosed boxing? Oh, Slick, you're muted, my brother. Cardinal sin, the cardinal sin. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to take the dog shot on Calvin Cater, man. I think Calvin Cater definitely has a slick boxing. And the one thing that I really like about him that I've seen from Tape Study is just his uppercut. And we've seen that that really deter a lot of people from going into the grappling or wrestling. And I'm not just real too high on Sterling's wrestling. You know, there's a guy coming into this fight, only landing 12 out of 63 takedowns in his whole career, shooting at a 25% clip. He doesn't really have that great of wrestling. He just has that great of grappling, you know, like like what he did against Sanhagen. Once he was able to take advantage of Sanhagen, basically giving him his back, he basically hopped right on it. And we've seen this guy basically have Jan in over four minutes of back control and not be able to submit Jan, you know. So I'm not really too high on, on Aljo really being able to submit Calvin Cater. And if this fight is on the feet, man, I got to give the edge to Calvin Cater. I love his combinations. And the one thing that we've seen about Aljo in his whole career is that he's basically used to uh, fighting one-two punchers. You know, basically Sean O'Malley in his last fight, Jan, Jan is basically a one-two type of guy. He probably implements some type of kick afterwards, but more of a one-two type of guy. And I just think Calvin Cater's combinations is just going to be able to cause trouble for him and probably deter him from shooting the blind takedowns that he usually, uh, like he did against Jan, you know, the guy that was, I would say, deterred from the takedowns after a couple rounds. I just don't think he's going to be able to submit Calvin Cater. He's only had one submission loss his whole career after 30 fights. I think Calvin Cater keeps his fight on the feet. And I would say just caused way more damage than Aljo causes him. So give me Calvin Cater money line at plus 140. Hey, man, if it's damage over control, if that's what the judges are scoring, as they say they do, then Calvin Cater certainly has the path to victory. I, I think I'm starting to come around to the dog side here. I'm on a lot of dogs on this card. Why not a hard-nosed dog like Calvin Cater, right? I, I feel you here. And uh, I like the points that Slick made. Aljo, when he does get his takedowns, He's got to work hard for him, man. He's not shooting a power double leg and getting it on the first one. It's his eighth takedown, final attempt on trip against the cage or, you know, wild exchange, a scramble, and he gets it. He's not this pure kind of takedown wrestling artist. So it might be easier said than done to get his grappling going. And if he's having trouble, the dog is going to be live. The odds will quickly flip in the live market. So uh, I like it, guys. I like your angles on Calvin Cater. I think you've convinced me to move to that side. All right, it's time for the featured prelim of the evening, and this is an awesome fight. We have Yuri Prohaska taking on Alexander Rakic. Yuri, the fan favorite, the samurai, right? 
European samurai punching trees in the woods for his training. I mean, he's got this, this dope martial arts ethos and he tries to kind of live that philosophy. People love him for it. Uh, and he's dangerous, man. Explosive fighter, spinning attacks, right? Unpredictable, unorthodox, odd angles. You never know where year he's coming from. He's taken on a really damn good fighter in Alexander Rakic, man, a guy who was basically one fight away from the light heavyweight championship. He was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jan Blahovich. That was a great, really good, even fight, and he injured his leg. So he's been away for about two years now, coming back, but the leg injury is significant because if it's back and it's and it's not 100%, uh, I, I would worry about him. But if he looks in damn good shape, man, and if the leg is okay, holy smokes, you talk about Alex Pereira's leg kicks. Rakic has some punishing low kicks himself. And if he can land those on Yiri, I feel like he might immobilize him or at least make the explosive unorthodox fighter that much less explosive and without his feet grounded underneath him on a weak calf. So for me, man, I'm going to take the, the – not the shot. He's the favorite, man, surprising enough. right? I feel like Yiri's going to be a popular dog pick, and I totally get it. But I like me some Alexander Rakic. I think he's the more athletic fighter with maybe even more paths to victory using his wrestling, his kickboxing. I like Rakic in this matchup, man. I won't be this. I won't be surprised though if my colleagues disagree with me, Mister Plus Money. Do you like the plus one hundred dog Yiri Prohaska, or are you going Alexander Rakic with me in this fight? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, they don't call me Mr. Plus Money because I take guys that aren't plus money <laughs> that lose. Or and I don't know what I was trying to say. That. <laughs> anyway, uh, listen, I'm going with Yuri. This is no, there's no question in this fight, boys. Uh, I, I understand your points. And Rakic, once upon a time, was on his way, but Yuri. Like didn't even exist at that point, man. So I like Yuri. Uh, I don't think there's anywhere Rakic can beat him. Uh, maybe if he takes him down, I, I guess. I, I, I don't know. But Yuri's got those uppercuts from hell. And just angles we've never seen before, man. He takes a step back and hits you with a left upper. It's crazy, bro. Uh, he put, <laughs> It's weird how he put so much power into those uh, awkward angles. But I will say this. Uh, I don't think this fight's going the distance. Yuri is kill or be killed, no matter what, and and he goes out on his sword when he does go out. So I, I think this is over quick. Maybe, oh, gosh, man, second round, Yuri KO. Wow. I like the prediction. I like the point you made about power on the odd angles, right? It's easy to take a weird angle, but, you know, it's not so easy to get power behind that shot. He's able to find devastating shots from anywhere, really. So very creative with his striking. Uh, right now, we're talking about rounds, how quick it'll be over. Mr. Plus likes a second round KO for Yuri. Over under set at two and a half, under two and a half, minus 160. So odds makers also leaning that it won't go the whole way. Slick, do you also think someone is getting someone out of here in this fight? Yeah, man. I, honestly, man, I, I think Yuri's about to get KO'd in this spot, man. I one thing I, I watched from tape, man, that I think Rockets could really, really take advantage of is the left straight that Yuri throws, man. This guy leans his head to the right side so hard. And honestly, man, I think Rockets going to head kick KO him. Oh, I like it. I think oh my I just, God. if Rockets has any type of tape study, bro, like me, he will take advantage of that. Whenever Yuri throws that left straight, he dips his head. He'll he'll throw it like this, you know, like he'll like he he and bro, if he takes advantage of it, I think he gets KO. Man, I'm on Rockets in this spot, and I can honestly see a world where Yuri has zero to little takedown defense. Man, this guy, I think I could blow right now into this YouTube video, and he'll probably fall. So, like, this guy, like, he, one thing I hate about him, too, is his scrambles. Like, his scrambles are just, all right, fuck it. I'm trying to get out of this. It's not really, like, technical scrambles. And that's what really led him to get down on his back damn near the whole fight against Glover. You know, he was just trying them crazy-ass brawls. And honestly, I've seen a lot of from Rockets that if he gets this fight down to the ground, I could see him. on. I, I don't think if Rockets gets it, I think 
Rocket's best way to knock out Yuri is on the feet with that head kick or something else. But if he gets this fight down to the ground, I will honestly say this will probably be one of the most boring fights on the card, especially with Rockets, man. This guy, he's more of a lay and pray type of fighter. He doesn't really implement the ground and pound as much as you would like to. And he just plays the full card game a lot. He doesn't really try to go to that half guard. If there's like, like Kayla Harrison, you know, if there's one minute left on the clock, he's going to stay there. He has great fight IQ. He's not going to try to make a mistake for Yuri to capitalize. So I think this is a good spot for Rockets, man. I think a lot of people are going to be on Yuri because of the plus money. He's been in more of the people's eyes the last two years. I think Rockets, as long as his knee doesn't buckle in the first round or second round, I think he could probably make this boring or he could knock out Yuri with a head kick in the first or second round. Slick looking for the high kick. Mr. Plus looking for the Yuri uppercut. I'm looking for the Rakic low kicks. We all got a different little angle of how we see this fight playing out. One thing's for sure, Yuri is really dangerous, but he also has really bad defense. So who gets to who first? I don't think this one's going the whole way. I the Darce Choke is a submission executed from the front headlock position.